Last week, we focused on Mitzrayim, the narrow place. This week, in the midst of the Chag, we want to offer eight Passover practices that can lead to collective liberation. This is Jews Talk Racial Justice with April and Tracy. A weekly show hosted by April Baskin and Tracy Guy Decker. In a complex world, change takes courage. Wholehearted relationships can keep us accountable. So April, in our last episode, <clears throat> which um, which published right before Seder, first Seder, um, we talked about the fact that we need to get really clear and honest about the fact that for many black folks and other um, people of color in America, the sea never parted and they remain in Mitzrayim in Egypt. Also another translation of Mitzrayim is the narrow place. And so today, this episode is dropping in the middle of the holiday. We were just um, talking about the fact that there are some practices of Passover that can be maybe instructive on how we move toward liberation. So I can't wait to hear this this juicy list that you have uh, that you've put together. Yes, that you also helped to contribute to. Thank you. So I think since there are eight different components of, do you remember what I called it, Tracy? Yeah, you said eight Passover practices that can move us toward collective liberation. Yay! <laughs> Hashtag racial justice. Okay, so, um, okay, so where do I start? Okay, can I make a suggestion? I would love sure. for you to start with the, um, the cleaning. Yeah, I was leaning toward that too. So similar to how we start the holiday itself in preparation for the holiday uh, is to clean our houses thoroughly and specifically to zero in on something that we want to be removing. In this case for the holiday, it's chametz or items that are leavened, contain leaven, leavening, um, and or other foods, depending upon your Jewish custom, that are not permitted uh, on Passover, during Passover. And you need to actually remove them from your house. Uh, at times people throw it out. Other times people like my mother was like, this food is valuable. So we're moving it into our distance garage or putting it in our storage facility because we need this food when the holiday is over. Or like there's a custom to sell it to someone and then maybe buy it yeah, back afterwards. That's another, but you have to yeah. get it out of your possession. Get it out of your possession, right? And so this is our first practice that we want to sort of modify a bit and say, in general, this is also a good practice as it relates to racial justice, is to pick one thing, one manifestation of internalized. Um, oppression for people of color and for internalized oppressor material for people who are white or who are categor categorized um, by white much of the time in daily life in society to um, one practice is to just pick well there are many different attributes of oppression or oppressor material but to pick one at, at a time and practice awareness and noticing throughout your being, throughout your thought patterns and your memories and your spirit, um, that thing uh, and a reference tool that might be useful that we haven't fully unpacked yet uh, are different attributes of, of white supremacy culture, or as Sonia Renee Taylor refers to it, white supremacist delusion. Um, and some of those things include right to comfort feeling entitled to comfort in most situations or um, urgency or perfectionism and uh, is to take time to start to notice and engage in essentially um, cheshbon hanefesh, right? Um, accounting, an accounting of the soul. Yeah, an accounting of the soul. Uh, thank you, Tracy has my back as per usual. Uh, and yeah, so that's the first one. There's more I could say, but I want to, I don't want to get too long here because we have eight to cover. So that's the first one is to take time, um, in within and, and literally both. So part of the a metaphor is, you know, the house being your inner world, but also your actual home, 
is also to perhaps do an inventory and are your racial justice values reflected in the products you buy, on the art that is on your walls, on the books on your bookshelf? Are you buying from artists and company, companies and thought leaders of color? Are you buying from white folks who are um, courageous allies to people of color, whether or not that relates to what they're doing, but are they someone who has shown over the course of their lives that they are committed um, to racial justice? And even more in terms of if you want to be edgier and uh, even more stringent is, is um, are they committed anti-racists? Right? Are they committed to an ongoing practice, not of perfection, but of doing this? And, and this is not to say necessarily that you need to go through your home and remove anything that wasn't purchased from a Black company, but it's to notice. It is to notice that and in an appreciative, positive sense, begin to think about where there might be opportunities in your home and the things that your family does to begin to incorporate more anti-racism into your ecosystem. So next up, we have a shift in diet. I really love this one, right? So on Passover, and for a lot of people, it's difficult in various ways for various reasons. And people also within our community, I think it's at times helpful to be very inclusive and say that there are a range of different kinds of practices, not only around Sephardic and Mizrahi and Ashkenazi, but also just in terms of level of observance. And there are many people who um, find Passover meaningful and they observe it in all kinds of ways, right? But in general, traditionally, there's a shift in diet and there's an emphasis on replacing bread, leavened bread with matzah. And also depending upon your custom, also perhaps not eating other foods that um, depending upon a minchag or Jewish custom, the Jewish custom you observe are also not permitted on Passover. And um, so here, what I'm excited about is um, less so about literal food, although that absolutely is incredibly important, but is just thinking more broadly about what you're ingesting. What is your diet? Are you feeding yourself sources and thought leadership that support a belief system that is more powerfully anti-racist and liberatory? Are you listening to leaders who not only bring rigor, um, uh, but also compassion and practical tools that help you unpack this. Again, ideally you have a diet that has a robust suite of nutrients. So you're listening um, as much as you are able to and are ready to, to thought leaders who are edgier and who are really out in front and leading and who might not make things more practical for you, but help anchor you in a North star of where you wanna be moving toward. And then you have other people who may share your identity or may, who may have different identities to you, but just like um, in your life in general, right? Like we're taught that we should eat multicolored vegetables in an effort to get a robust, um, diverse set of minerals and vitamins and nutrients. You ideally wanna do that with your racial justice work. And ideally, um, and with your liberation work more broadly and also specifically racial justice work is to be thoughtful about your diet on social media, about the shows you watch, um, knowing that Collectively, yes, one person only makes much of a difference. We could get into that whole debate, but but that collectively, the shows we're choosing to watch, people track that data, right? So where are we putting our presence and therefore money or attention, right? And also in terms of what we're communicating to different corporations and leaders by the ways in which we show up or choose not to show up. So I think with this diet piece, just as we eat matzah, I think with a diet, um, an area of what we are, our consumption, I think that's a, the best word, that we can be mindful about our consumption in two ways, both what are we proactively nourishing ourselves with and what are we choosing to put a boundary around, um, whether that is ongoing and permanent or temp um, temporary uh, or in seasons or phases. There's a lot of different options here, but it's to beginning, beginning to be more mindful about this and recognizing we have the power of choice. Tracy, I, did you want to add something? I just really want to underline what you just said about um, 
the positive and the negative piece of not negative, but avoidant piece of the diet, because I think kosh root in general, which is the laws of kosher, the laws of keeping kosher requires you to be more, requires people to be more aware of what it is that you're consuming. Um, and then Passover adds another layer to kosh root. And so I think the, the learning that the sort of meta learning from this that April's pointing to is, um, is really interesting. And I, and I love the idea of like, even just for a time, go on a diet, a, a, you know, a media diet where you're paying attention and, and thinking about things that you both that you want to bring in and that you want to not bring in. I, I really love that as a, as a practice. Yeah. And that, and to me, I, I think that gives us a lot more freedom that it doesn't have to be only about adding. It can also be about making room. And it's not only about ex exclusion. At times we don't, at times people think you have to immediately exclude. And this is just in general for life, that at times there are ways we can make meaningful change without excluding and starting to just introduce healthier things into our diet or a more inspiring, um, more aligned person into our social or professional network. And eventually we're going to have to make some choices, but it doesn't all have to happen at once. Right. And I mean, to your point with the Passover, using it as a Passover practice, like chametz is not bad. It's, you know, when it's not Passover, chametz is fine. It's good. Um, and so, and there are bad things that you should take out of your diet, but my point is just like that intentional temporary or even more permanent noticing and choice, uh, choice opportunities is not, uh, necessarily, it doesn't have to be a huge judgment call. Right. But that's another way that we can move toward what's the word, right? Like is, is to move toward collective liberation. That's, that's sort of my phrase for, um, what some may call the messianic era is when we've achieved collective liberation, Ooh, I just which chill. includes all sentient <laughs> beings and the earth as well. It is a comprehensive. Yeah. <laughs> wow. I just right? got a chill. Collective liberation is the messianic age. Whoo. That's gorgeous. Yay. Thanks. Right. So, so we're talking about from Mitzrayim to messianic collective messianic era, collective liberation. And, the, and, and that shows a little bit of my uh, reform movement bias. Some people think necessarily that it might be, literally be a person. And I grew up in a context where it was more thought of as a time and a, a context more so than any one singular person. So uh, next up is um, <laughs> the four children. Uh, I want to name, so I really love the four children as it relates to some moving out of Mitzrayim and toward collective liberation strategy in terms of recognizing, uh, and I'm immediately reminded of this song that I shared in one of our courses, our racial justice intensive um, uh, called Whiteness Chavruta. Um, one of the things that we shared in one of the sessions was a song from uh, Ulali called All My Ancestors. And I think of the four children uh, as being aligned with this song, All My Ancestors, a little bit. Although it's it, the four children traditionally can be a little bit more harsh in some ways. But it's this idea that as we're working um, and doing our work, that there are different people with different narratives. And that each one of them, I love this, as I'm like nerding out right now. <laughs> As, a, as a, someone who um, teaches about uh, racial equity and, and effective multicultural strategy and interaction, and one of the four principles in that um, aligns beautifully with this idea of the four children, that there are four children with four different tendencies and kinds of questions. And because there are differences in them, they also require different responses. For one of them, I, I think the response traditionally is a little bit harsh. <laughs> the child is told, you know, if, you know, when when a child asks the in the custom, do you want to say it, Tracy? The thing about setting your teeth on edge, setting their teeth on edge, that thing. Oh, I don't remember that. Would be that. <laughs> I was thinking more about just the in, in my in my. I think I, I think we had one of the classic versions of the Haggadah when I was yeah, if, like, I can't remember. Olders one. Or Essentially, like yeah, or Maxwell, Maxwell House, right? House, Maxwell House. Yeah. I, I'm not sure if it's. It's not quite that one, but it's another one that I think like many, many, many families. Maxwell House is the one I grew up with from the 1920s. Yeah. Yeah. And, and it talks about how the, um, the child who says, why do, why do you do you, this? So, yeah. so they distance, right. And, and the, and the text, as I recall, is supposed to say, which I would not say this to my child. Well, you know, like you wouldn't have been let out of Egypt. 
if that's right. how you felt. Like this is a collective thing. And since you're, okay, so I'm, I'm not, I'm not, I'm not taking this wholesale from the traditional text. My point is, is as we're moving through this to recognize that different people are in different places with this. And it's helpful to notice that. And so maybe you want to work with the kid who's down with it, who's into it. Maybe you want to work with the person who is like, I'm here for it. And maybe another person who um, is really inquisitive or doesn't know what questions to ask, but cares or that people enter this work in different ways. And it's still possible to achieve. We don't need 100% alignment of humanity in order for us to achieve monumental feats. We just need a critical mass of people who are asking aligned questions and additional people who are asking slightly not aligned questions that help to agitate us and to strengthen the questions we're asking and to strengthen our strategies. So my point is four kinds of people, <laughs> four plus kinds of folks in this work and to recognize that people are at different developmental levels. Um, and I probably quoted her before and I'll quote her again. I love when um, uh, Sherry Brown has said that um, you need to meet people where they are. It's like, you might want somebody to be somewhere else, but they are where they are. And the thing is, that doesn't mean that every person, whatever your work you might be doing is that you have to work with, so you can choose, right? But, but you wanna make a choice around being aware and uh, frank and within your own mind of, this is where this person is and do you want to work with them if this is where they are, because it's not going to help me to wish they were farther along than they are because they're not yet. And so then we get to make that choice and decide it. if this is someone in a friendship, a partnership in moving work toward moving our world toward justice, if we want to take that on or not. It just reminds me of the sort of the idea that this work is too important to throw people away. And so I think that if folks mm -hmm. are in our presence and asking questions with genuine Kavana, because you know, there is a, a method of trolling. And uses... intention. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, Kavana is with intention. Um, so if the, there, there is a, a method of trolling that involves asking questions. So that's not what I'm talking about, but I think if someone is asking questions, even if those questions are difficult or wicked as our, as our Haggadah calls it. Right. Um, if they're, if they come from genuine desire to learn, then this work is too important to throw people away. Yeah. And what I would add though, at times too, <laughs> to kick it up a notch is, um, I think it's important to honor all questions. And if someone's at a certain developmental level, they might not be ready to, to join a specific leadership team or a specific project yet. And there's likely a different place from their position, from what they know, where they can be met. And that's the core principle without getting into some of the specifics of um, uh, some favoritism or some meanness that could play out at times in some of our traditional Jewish texts is more this idea that there's a strat there's a resource and a strategy for every person. You just haven't, you might not have identified it yet. Um, and my hope is that there are enough people doing this work that the groups of people who may be hard for me to work with for any number of reasons, or they may find it hard for me to work with, hopefully I have some allies or some other partners of color in this work who do have the right medicine or resources for those folks, right? And, and so as to notice at times and to hold out a possibility, which can kind of transition into another point, that um, I hold out the possibility at times of being really clear around who I'm who I am well equipped to work with, which is a pretty broad range, but there are limitations to that. And also not saying, not dismissing those folks, but saying my medicine, oh, this um, indigenous concept of medicine, my medicine isn't quite right for them, but I know there are folks out there who do have medicine that can resonate with them. And thank God for that. Thank God is for that. It's wonderful, right? So I think that was number two, right? <laughs> or that was number three. That was number three. There was okay, the cleaning, okay. the diet, and the um, the children. The four children. Okay. Okay. All right. So I'm going to try to speed this up. The next that I want to talk about is, oh, I, should, I could potentially should say this till the end, is Elijah. I want to name here, y'all, that uh, sometimes it's called Elijah's cup or Miriam's cup. There's this idea within traditional Judaism that we open the door during Passover to welcome in guests or strangers and also to see if Elijah is there to inform us, the prophet Elijah is there to inform us that the messianic age or the Messiah is coming. And 
in our work, I think it's so important. This is a huge part of a huge underpinning of my work with Joyous Justice is this idea of, of me always holding out that radical new possibilities are possible. And that's not the core place from where I work, but I work with an openness to a metaphorical Elijah coming at any time and me working to have enough agility in my work that I can respond and shift when that happens, when there is a big breakthrough, when something that I didn't think would happen and what, what happened so quickly does for any number of reasons. Yeah, that's really beautiful. We keep the cup um, ready for when Elijah does come. Yeah, and this happens in movement work. Like we've seen this in a lot of different areas around racial justice, but the example that first comes to mind for me is around marriage equality, that there were organizers and activists who were working for decades and that I have like full body chills. And then there's an opening and a moment at times where something monumental that normally would take decades to happen can happen in a matter of months. And it was able to happen in part because there were people who were willing to say, who were willing to be open despite all of the pain and trauma that had happened before. Um, and despite the fatigue that enough people had been preparing for that potential for years that when it came, they were ready to act and take action and make the most, yeah. right? And so that's with us too with racial justice is uh, as much as possible to take it as far as you can. And then also notice if there's certain limitations then you might need to conform to those limitations if there's certain ways that you're blocked, but still in your mind, still be pushing for that freedom in your mind and engaging your radical imagination of, okay, I'm currently limited in my current role. And for various reasons, I might not be able to shift, but I'm going to hold that it's possible for somewhere, for an agency, for a nonprofit, for a corporation to have this powerful impact in the world. And I'm going to keep cultivating that. So if and when I happen by fluke to become the CEO or something happens or an opportunity comes up at a firm that's doing just what I said, I see it and I'm able to act on it and make the most of that, that Elijah moment. All right. We just finished for y'all. We're at the halfway point. Here we go. Let's keep it going. So uh, for number five is the Seder itself. Um, Seder means order. I also like thinking of it as formation. Shout out to Beyonce. Let's get in formation. Let's have order. Is that there's room for the magical Elijah to come in. And part of what allows Elijah to work, as we just talked about, is having different rituals and structure and practices that are consistent that don't necessarily have to be as long as a traditional Seder, that ideally incorporate parts of the Seder overall of remembering our purpose and what we're doing and being intentional in our process and having some wine or some metaphorical wine, having something, right? Like this is also a part of um, best, prince around, best principles around habit formation is having some sweetness in there, right? And, and celebration around honoring what's good right? But something that it helps a, a collective of people engage in rituals that they can begin to um, expect and help them feel safe and also make room for them to be more creative within um, a ritualized uh, practice that can be very elaborate or relatively simple, but consistent. That's beautiful. That's beautiful. Thanks. Yeah. <laughs> right. All right. So that was five. That was five. Mm -hmm. Keep going ahead. I just wrote six. Okay. So, um, yeah. So number six is, and noticing the art of what's happening here in this Seder that is for a specific reason in the holiday, but I think I can extrapolate it more broadly to racial justice work. So we begin thinking about these different pieces around our diet and, and our home and meticulously going through and, and bringing our liberatory consciousness into our individual selves and the spheres in which we operate, right? And then we have rituals to help keep us on track and remind us of why we're doing what we're doing and have some shared expectations with the people with whom we're doing this work around that rhythm, right? And while we're doing that, is noticing the freedom that we do have access to and getting some pillows and relaxing a little. And that might not in your day-to-day -day work or activism or leadership look like necessarily literally pillows, but it might look like more comfortable shoes. 
It might look like having a water bottle with you at all times that maybe has some lemon in it, or if you need electrolytes, what else might that look like, Tracy? Taking breaks and not giving yourself a hard time about it. Yeah. Taking breaks, reclining, noticing the freedom that we do have. We're still in this rhyme, but it isn't as bad as it was before. And I believe, as I think I've talked about, that I believe in incorporating our destination into our process, right? The more we can align with that, the faster that it can come, right? And to me in the future, ideally, we're still engaging in, I want to engage in rigorous things in a messianic era, but I want them to be things that bring people joy or that contribute to the people around me in deep relationship and, and, and contributing to the further um, elevation of our consciousness around what's possible for humans and all um, sentient creatures with whom we interact on this gorgeous planet and in this broader universe, right? So that's, that's always gonna be happening. And ideally we have time to, to exhale and breathe and let our shoulders relax um, and have a little bit of wine or whatever version of that if day drinking is probably not the best practice in general. So, so having fresh juice, fresh vegetable or fruit juice or eating delicious fruits and vegetables and yummy sandwiches that nourish us and feel good and notice who's near us, right? Um, and savor, right? Like I can pause in this moment in real time and see Tracy on my screen in front of me and think, wow, not only do I get to do work that I'm passionate about, but I get to do it with such a remarkable, loving, brilliant, um, uh, consistent, reliable, joyful partner. You make me cry. Right? <laughs> I know I'm starting to cry, right? You know, that like to relax into and not let our working to get out of Mitzrayim allow us not to see some of the liberation and freedom that is here right now and is real right now in this moment, <laughs> right? So I love you, Tracy. <laughs> I love you too, April. So that was six, right? Yes. All right. Home stretch, y'all. Um, uh, I think I'm going to let you bring us home with the eighth one, Tracy, since it was your idea. You had one that I think you might remember. Uh, so for seven is we're doing this in community and with our family, right? So is the Jewish Passover tradition of if you're able to, Inviting a lot of people to your saber, Seder table, <laughs> Saber, <laughs> your Saber table. <laughs> um, inviting a lot of people to your Seder and, uh, or attending a Seder that has a number of people involved is this idea of community. <laughs> is that this work is best done in the context of community, especially since it is far more work than any one person or one team can do. We need community. We need community around this work and our movement that like Passover, the different minchagim, I think would be the plural, the different customs, yes. customs uh, might vary, but this idea of getting in formation continued, but in the context of many of us working in alignment with both diversity, but alignment around some shared principles uh, in within a broader swath of our work. And then as movements get even bigger, there might be different practices, right? And all of those things, right? We're dealing with so many adaptive challenges and so many variables that the more we can lean into the power and strength of that diversity and the strength and power that diversity has as we work on our own internal cultural competence, meaning our own ability to work effectively and be open-minded as we work across lines of difference. That's great. And oftentimes we don't even need to work that much across lines of difference. There are specific leaders who are doing that, but more be at peace and that it's okay that within a similar movement, some other people have different strategies, some of which we agree with and some of which we don't, but ultimately is it truly moving us in a broader direction toward collective liberation? Yes, then let's keep it moving. <laughs> Right? 
Um, yeah. So is, is community that um, part of Mitzrayim involves contraction and isolation and part of the effect of internalized depression is to blame the victim and internalize that blame, right? And so one of the best things community can do is to lift up our heads, right? And ritual can help us start to do that and look around and see that we aren't alone. And that in fact, this is a broader issue, which we hear classically throughout a number of community organizing stories. Historically and today is often can be actually a galvanizing thing for people. It's because often at times oppression works to have the person blame themselves. And once they realize it's not them and it's a broader thing, then there's a sort of um, inspired righteousness and rage. Although again, I think rage uh, works for different things for different people, but isn't ultimately, but is an initial rage that opens up this fire within a person and helps them connect with their, reconnect with their spirit and say, it wasn't me all along. <laughs> this is a trick. <laughs> this is a setup. And we can work in community to address this um, and, to, and to not let this ignorance and oppression continue because we're going to link arm in arm um, or if touching is not your thing, walk side by side and move toward collective liberation. Yeah. So I'll just bring us home. Number eight is actually related to some of the other things, but that is the power of questions. So this is related to the children that that um, April named and also to the cleaning um, that we talked about, but to really start to, to, some of the ways that we are able to do that, our tradition teaches us to ask, to ask why, to ask how, and in those questions, it's not judgment. Um, it, it is just, a an investigation in order to better understand and therefore metabolize in different ways. And so I would offer that as just the final Passover practice um, to move us I would to add, collective liberation. Yeah. Yes. Thank you. And I would add a little bit more to this briefly, which is that um, something I learned from my teacher and friend, Yula McCoy, that I've used in my teachings moving forward too, is that when you are in the work, right? If you're on the journey and you are learning from a person of color or you're learning from an inspiring leader and something happens, they do something or say something that is upsetting to you, is rather than checking out or being immediately critical or attacking them, uh, is to get curious, particularly if you don't understand. If something happened and it sort of miffs you a little bit and you're not fully sure, be willing to get humble and curious and to assume that you really may not know and um, to ask questions or to uh, reach out. And rather than disengaging or engaging in fight or flight, a way to remain present is to stay in a space of curiosity and asking questions and openness an openness to insight uh, and greater knowledge. Yeah, I would say replacing judgment with curiosity just in general serves, serves us well as human beings. So those are some of our eight Jewish practices and rituals that with a little bit of tweaking can be used to move us more quickly through Mitzrayim into spaciousness and um, collective liberation and a messianic era in which we are all free and able to be in loving relationship, doing fun, transformative things together from a place of possibility and shared common purpose rather than oppression and pain. Chag Sameach, happy Passover. And I'm so excited for us to continue to walk together in the direction of greater justice and joy. Tracy? Chag Sameach. Thanks for tuning in. Our show's theme music was composed by Elliot Hammer. You can find this track and other beats on Instagram at Elliot Hammer. If this episode resonated with you, please share it and subscribe. To join the conversation, visit JewsTalkRacialJustice.com, where you can send us a question or suggestion, access our show notes, and learn more about our team. Take care until next time, and stay humble and keep going.